We now move to our next panel on regulation alternatives. We're looking at other jurisdictions globally, at what they're doing to encourage investment, what they're doing to protect investors, and what they're doing to foment this new technology. Moderated by Mary Sirocco of the Settle Network, this panel will have Jason Chu, Peter Dytus, Renato Obisi Bloom, and Manny Rosenfeld as the panelists. Mary's a former investment professional at Union Bank of Switzerland and the World Bank. Jason Chu is the former crypto congressman of Taiwan and a leading expert on technology and regulation of technology throughout Asia. We've got Manny Rosenfeld from the Israel Bitcoin Association sharing what's going on in his country. From Brazil, we've got Renato Obisi Bloom, a leading internet lawyer and blockchain enthusiast. And finally, we've got Peter Dytus, one of the advisors to the SOV, the Marshall Islands Central Bank Digital Currency. Peter used to be a economist at the Bank of International Settlements. Without further ado, here's Mary. Hello, everybody. My name is Mary, Mary Sirocco. I will be the moderator of the regulations panel of other jurisdictions. Today, we will cover various jurisdictions around the world, including Asia, Latin America, Europe, and the Middle East. We have speakers from all around the world. And before I introduce them, let me introduce myself. My name is Mary. Um, I am the founder and CFO of Settle Network. We are a company of cross-border payment solutions in Latin America and Europe. Um, we do essentially a fiat on and off ramp for diverse companies, including exchanges such as Binance. Um, so let me introduce today our panelists that will be joining this discussion. We will discuss a little bit what is going on in the world regarding regulations. And we have Jason covering Asia in particular from Taiwan. Um, uh, he is a member of, he used to be a member of parliament in Taiwan. He's known as a crypto congressman. Uh, he's a vice chair of Taiwan FinTech Associations. And today he works at, um, at in Taiwan in particular with focus on development FinTech environments in Taiwan. So um, following that, we have many, many Rosenfeld. He is out of the Middle East in Israel. Uh, he's a mathematician from Tel Aviv. He worked as a head of research at the internet startup Similar Web. And for sure, many of you know about Similar Web. That's very impressive. Uh, he established the Bitcoin community in Israel and founded Bitcoin, Israel's first Bitcoin exchange service. Um, he's also the chairman of the Israel Bitcoin Association today. Um, we also have Renato from Office of Bloom, uh, covering Latin America, an amazing region. <laughs> he is based out of Brazil. He is the chairman of Office of Bloom Law Firm. And it is an amazing added value to have somebody like him today covering all the regulation that's going on in Latin America. He's a professor at various universities across Brazil and has written diverse articles as well about the subject. So uh, last but not least, we have Peter Ditches covering Europe. Uh, he is uh, talking with us here from Switzerland. He is the chief economist of SFB Technologies working on introducing crypto to the Marshall Islands. And this is something um, that we will like to cover and we would like to discuss a little bit. And that's very interesting. He previously was a secretary general of the Bank of International Settlements and also had assignments at the OECD at the World Bank. Fun fact, um, I used to work also at the World Bank, uh, but Peter, we did not get to meet, unfortunately. Um, so. Let's get started. Um, so to start today with today's topics, um, I want to each one of you to give me a little bit of context of what's going on, particularly in your region at an Asia level, um, let's say more continental, and then to give me a little bit of background on what's going on in each of your countries. So if you want many, um, I would like if you can start and give us a little bit of insight on what's going on in the Middle East um, on crypto regulation. Yes, so to be honest, the Middle East is kind of a lot of disconnected countries, so I can't speak too much about the Middle East in general. I can speak about Israel, so 
Israel has, been, has, has had a problem with regulation in the recent times, not just with cryptocurrencies, but in general, <laughs> because there were some problems with the elections in Israel. There's been a year without, uh, without a permanent government and parliament because there were elections and nobody got elected, so they made another elections half a year later, and that didn't work either. So there were another round of elections half a year later, so throughout this year, there wasn't really a functioning government. So any progress in regulation that we wanted to push forward uh, didn't really succeed. Um, but now that uh, finally there is a government, we are resuming these efforts to try to pass some new laws about how cryptocurrencies should be taxed and how, what anti-money anti laundering procedures should be put in place for it because one of the biggest problems in Israel with regards to Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies right now, which I think it's similar elsewhere in the world, but I think in Israel it's much, much mm -hmm. a bigger problem mm -hmm. that banks uh, very often refuse to support transactions uh, which involved uh, cryptocurrencies in some way. Now the, the bank itself, I'm, I'm not talking even about the bank itself trying to do something with cryptocurrencies. I mean, I just mm -hmm. want to sell some Bitcoins. I want to get some Israeli shekels in return. And the bank will, in many cases, will not allow me to do that. So that's a problem. Yeah. And the problem is, uh, is existing because uh, the regulation for AML in Bitcoin is not very clear. So the banks are saying that they can't manage the money laundering mm -hmm. risks. So they prefer to, to refuse it. Now, we do think that their approach is illegal because... Uh, the law in Israel says that the bank must provide service That's unless very they have a very good reason mm -hmm, not to mm -hmm. do so. Uh, but that said, that, that's a kind of situation. And we hope that once the, uh, the committees in the parliament, in the Knesset, will approve some new, um, some new laws, we will hopefully not have this problem as much. Okay, that's a very interesting point that many is touching on uh, in terms of the situation where you have no regulation and the concern financial institutions have with uh, money laundering, uh, KYC, all related to compliance, right? So uh, that brings me back to Latin America. I know that there is a general consensus of unregulation. Um, however, how can companies proceed and work in a regulated basis? So what have you been seeing, Renato, in general in Latin America and in particular in Brazil? Hi, Mary. Hello, everyone. When we talk about regulation in Latin America, uh, I need to start from the beginning, telling you that, you know, Latin America countries are still on the beginning of the creation of the regulation uh, specific for crypto coins and also blockchain issues. Brazil is leading these issues, this point. We have uh, some several different bills of law in our Congress. We have some specific regulations as well by the Brazilian Central Bank and also the, the SEC, Secure Exchange Commission, Brazilian SEC. And we have also some general regulations from other, other sectors. Basically, we, what we have right now and what the countries are developing is uh, regulations uh, regarding the concept of the coin. Uh, for instance, like here in Brazil, uh, right now, we don't have the same uh, the same value, the crypto coin, as a money. Uh, the Brazilian Central Bank and the other mm -hmm. regulations, they understand that we don't have, you know, this, the, the same pattern. But we have mm -hmm. some ways, you know, to, to understand how, how to apply as an asset. Uh, usually, uh, all the regulations around Latin America understands that uh, crypto coins uh, are assets, not exactly money. That's the basic Exactly. Difference. Yeah, of course, we have yeah. another views of law regarding other issues, but basically what I, 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 I tell you right now is that we are in the beginning of the process creating new legislations. Okay, that's awesome. And what you just mentioned, what you just touched upon on um, how governments see cryptocurrencies either as an asset or as a, another form of money is very interesting, and we will discuss this further on when we touch base on the stablecoin issues and uh, how we 
stable coins could be a promoter of, you know, a big promoter of uh, electronic cash uh, system to enable a lot of transactions cross border. But before we get to that, um, I would like to have the input on Peter on Europe in particular. What are you seeing in Switzerland? I know the ECB has been particularly hefty and, um, you know, like had a very big role on regulation and very bulk, vocal all the time. So what have you been seeing on your side? Well, uh, that's an interesting question because you have to realize um, that Europe, while well, you have Europe and you have uh, the ECB and you have the European Commission, in the end, regulation in many respects is really driven by countries. And therefore, um, I think the point that Renato made, I think is the key point that in no country is cryptocurrencies are accepted as currencies, as money. So they are dealt with like assets. They are dealt with like security. Some countries are grappling with it. Some even haven't defined it. There's no clear regulatory framework for those crypto assets. And this is why I think there's a lot of interest in actually getting, getting to some f form of crypto money, whether it's a CBDC or something similar, um, that would reduce dramatically the regulatory uncertainty. And uh, once you have money, there are laws that can be applied to foreign currencies. And, and so you have a lot of automaticity that currently you don't have. It's a kind of case by case thing. Now, everyone is in Europe is working on it. And I think it's probably fair to say that Switzerland is among the most advanced in terms of the regulatory framework for banks and financial uh, fintech companies. There's even a... Um, there's the Crypto Valley in Switzerland, uh, uh, located around Zug. There's a quite vibrant uh, economy there. Uh, you can even pay your taxes in Bitcoin in the canton. So that's quite, quite amazing. And uh, there are several banks who have started to deal uh, with crypto and have gotten licenses at different stages. So I think, uh, but I think we have to realize it's not money. And uh, the Switzerland and Liechtenstein, they try sort of to put together a regulatory framework to deal with uh, those crypto assets while awaiting the emergence of some crypto money, whether it's in form of the uh, ECB or whether it's in Sweden, the e krona which is fairly advanced in concept at least. Um, I think it's fair to say in Switzerland itself, the Swiss National Bank is not planning anytime soon to introduce its own um, digital form of the Swiss franc. So that, mm -hmm. that's, I mm -hmm. think, in short, the situation. That's very interesting. And from a, let's say, from a government standpoint, would that be issuing their own cryptocurrency? Would that be in their best interest of their citizens and their best interest in protection of the central bank's best interest, right? Because if we think about um, a sovereign currency, then it would be, of course, in, in, in detriment of any other stable coin that's going on um, that has been launched already. What do you think about that? Well, I think uh, from the point of view of central banks, the other stable coins, they probably, if I say it sort of flippantly, they couldn't care less really. It's not their problem if other people have a stable coin that is not successful because they issue their own currency. I think um, when you look at it from a central bank's perspective, the key thing to realize is that you may introduce a retail CBDC, so a, a uh, crypto version of your existing fiat money, but that may be just too attractive for the people. So if you have a financial crisis, um, why would you hold your money at UBS if you have a problem, if UBS might have a problem, you just with a flip on your iPhone or on your smartphone, you go into uh, the uh, crypto version and everything is fully insured with the SMB. And I think those fast switches in and out of a digital currency that is guaranteed, like the paper currency floating around, uh, those fast switches, I think, is what makes central banks think a lot about 
is it a good idea? And if it is a good idea of how to introduce it? I think that's, that's really the big question. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So, um, and I want to talk a little bit before we continue with the subject. This brings me to Asia and what China has been working on and, and like announcing to the world um, their big efforts towards blockchain and publishing their own blockchain in China for the whole country. It brings me to Asia, right? What is Asia doing right now in terms of crypto? Our, I know Korea is very regulated. Japan has issued another license for exchanges recently. Um, what do you think, Jason? What have you been seeing in Asia? Uh, what do you think the tendency is? I know there are many um, countries in Asia that think in very uh, opposite ways as well. So is there a, a similar tendency or you think that, um, that crypto adoption is, is moving forward? I think uh, definitely the, the China's issuance or testing of the so-called uh, national digital currency or uh, DC, DCAP, uh, digital currency uh, electronic payment system, is really sending shockwaves around the world. Originally, U.S. came, came out with Libra, but has met with obstacles and challenges in the U.S. Congress. And somehow it has stalled over time. And, and somehow pivoted from a consortium uh, platform to become a stablecoin uh, play. But China has really you know, um, uh, boost their uh, process and really accelerate the progress uh, since the uh, January this year due to the um, US and China trade war. And it is very clear to um, the international observers that China is doing this decep is because they want to decouple U.S. dollars. And it's clear that because of the escalation of trade war and Trump's um, attitude um, towards China, this is going to be even more fierce in the, uh, in the next few months to come. So China already tested their decep in four cities, uh, Guang, uh, Hangzhou, Shenzhen, uh, Xiong'an, and uh, Shanghai. So all together, with a total population of over uh, 300 uh, million people, it is suppress the uh, population of the U.S. So in no time, China will suppress U.S.'s uh, progress in digital payment. And it is, to me, a very clear fact that they, China will extend this DSA to um, its uh, neighboring countries uh, such as in countries in Southeast East Asia or in Middle Asia to, com to control its one belt, one row financing. And so on, on, that, on that, that side, China is very aggressive. And we don't see no stoppage of the China's progress. But in terms of other jurisdictions in Asia, it's rather slow. Uh, Japan is slow because of COVID-19. Um, and uh, uh, South Korea is also very slow. I don't see any movements in that regard. Uh, Singapore, um, um, originally, I think it has a good position in uh, becoming the leading ju jurisdiction to embrace the uh, uh, crypto payment. But I think because of COVID-19, it, uh, it has also stalled. Uh, mm -hmm. for, however, in Taiwan, we have been uh, very uh, aggressive in um, uh, taking more more uh, solid stance on cryptocurrency. Uh, we have a new uh, uh, financial supervisory commissioner who is very widely uh, uh, receptive of the uh, cryptocurrency. When I was a legislator and member of the parliament from 2016 to 2020, I have championed the cryptocurrency and uh, blockchain as a national strategy. So with that, I have already passed the uh, security token offering law. So Taiwan becomes the first jurisdiction in the world to legalize uh, um, uh, security token offering. And we are open for the global investors to invest in Taiwan and with projects that can raise money from all over the world. And so that's, to me, it's exciting. It's not a, uh, 
uh, Taiwan is not a big country, but uh, because we are small, we are able to move fast. We are agile, mm -hmm. we are flexible, we are fast. And so I think there's a lot that we can look forward to because of the current um, COVID-19 status. U.S. is on a halt. Everything is sort of stopped over there with, you know, over 2 million people um, convicted with the coronavirus and over um, mm -hmm. 200,000 people already died. And so that's a scary uh, case to me. So I would say we will see more and more actions in Asia, uh, particularly uh, stemming from China and uh, uh, East Asia, including Japan, uh, um, uh, South Korea, Taiwan, and Singapore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. That that's very interesting. And COVID, right? It's it's uh, the situ the current situation we're in right now in a global pandemic. Um, it's very frightening for many, but also it's uh, it enables a lot of uh, awareness around cryptocurrency, specifically in Latin America. Um, volumes have been rising more and more each time due to the fact that... Mary? I think we lost her. So I'm not sure what's going on with her. Let's keep, let's keep the conversation. <laughs> um, yeah, sure, we could do next that. Steps. What's the next challenges for you, many? Yeah. So, yeah, so yeah, maybe I'll say a few more uh, words. Okay, yeah, yeah, Ronan is saying, yeah, okay, let's, let's continue. So, yeah, so uh, you mentioned the, the question of whether cryptocurrencies are considered an asset or a currency. In the end, we have the same situation in Israel. It's currently considered a, an asset because, yeah, if you look at the, the law in Israel that, that defines what is a currency, then it doesn't look like Bitcoin fits the, this uh, definition, which, uh, which I, don't, I don't think is correct. I mean, I think Bitcoin and the things which are similar to it should be considered a currency, but that's not the way it is according to the current law or according to the interpretation of the Israeli tax authority, which does say it's an asset. And uh, yeah, but the problem is not so much the fact that it is an asset, but uh, the, the specific laws in Israel regarding how how assets are taxed are not uh, are not very good. So if you try to um, to apply the laws that uh, work on assets and try to apply them to cryptocurrencies, then you get some absurd situations where you can't really use uh, the cryptocurrencies because there's a lot of overhead and reporting and all kinds of weird stuff that's going on. So we, um, yeah, with regards to, to this issue, we have two main um, uh, main initiatives. One is like, like a long-term thing, which we hope maybe in several years, uh, Bitcoin will be defined as a currency. And the other short-term direction is that while it's still being defined as an asset, find some... Um, and some new laws that will help use it, even though that it is an asset. So to make a few exceptions, so you can, uh, for example, uh, buy things for small amounts without having to report it as a tax event and so on. Air is back. Yes, apologize. Apologies for that. Um, so I wanted to discuss a little bit the adoption of stable coins in the world, right? I think that if we look at the stablecoin environment um, around the world, and if we look in, in terms of crypto adoption, like what originated as Bitcoin adoption at the beginning, then came all the altcoins, ICOs in 2017. What about the stablecoins that I think are rising in com contrast to the adoption of altcoins? So if we look a little bit at... Um, volume graphs and, and at adoption graphs, we will be able to see that originally uh, altcoins were used as a refuge for when Bitcoin went down. So when if Bitcoin went up, altcoins went down because people will move from altcoins to BTC. And when Bitcoin went down, people will go back to altcoins. But now that we have stable coins and stable coin pairs, such as USDT, TUSD, Pact, et cetera, uh, listed in exchanges, I would like to talk a little bit how we see that, right? If we look at the tendency of where the market is going, it looks like a lot of 
people are choosing to um, go to USAT when they're not in BTC. And that brings me to um, the concept of how introducing stable coins in each jurisdiction, let's talk about not only USD paired uh, stable coins, but also let's say Brazilian stable coin, Argentinian stable coin, Taiwanese stable coin, how all of these currencies will enable mass adoption and the movement towards a crypto FX um, environment. So um, I would like your opinion on that. Renata, in particular, you can start with Brazil. How do you feel about that? Thanks, Mary. Uh, I think stable coins is uh, an asset that just arrived to stay. Because if you, if you compare, you know, uh, uh, as much as you can to keep stable the value of a, not, not only a, a crypto coin, but any kind of assets or money, you know, if you have ways to control and to give the society some uh, specific, uh, not only concerns, you know, but trusts about this, it's going to work. Uh, I, I want to disagree the scenario right now about the COVID-19, because what's going on right now here in Brazil, and more and more people, even the government, uh, are using more crypto coins, especially bitcoins and other other coins as well, mm -hmm. as a way to you know to to avoid all this this scenario, difficult scenario. Because right now Brazil is uh, almost whole digital. We, we we need to you know to 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 move uh, from the analog to digital. And the last four forty five days, uh, we are experiencing uh, a very different scenario about this. So. Going back to, to stable coins, I, I think that uh, it's a reversible uh, scenario, and more and more we are, we are going to, to to be adapted and to to use this concept as well. Mm -hmm. And do you guys think? Um, I want to know the opinion of the rest of the panelists. Do you think that um, governments will be looking towards issuing their own stable coin? Um, I know that uh, we discussed a little bit earlier. Um, with Peter, I think, who mentioned that the ECB was looking into potentially issuing their own stable coin. Of course, with Euro, this will be quite easy uh, and, and to have, you know, adoption in so many countries. So what's your stake on that? Um, I'm, I'm not a trend, great fan of um, stable coins or not a fan, but I'm, I don't see a great future. I mean, there's <clears throat> there are two types of stable coins. There's privately issued stable coins, and there is central bank issued stable coins. Stable central banks issued ones are basically a, a, a digital form of their current currencies. Now that obviously has significant potential because it has all the support and the uh, the legal power and the economic power of a country behind it. And mm -hmm. uh, from a point of view of uh, someone who holds it, it's a credit risk-free asset. So that's an interesting thing. Uh, if you have uh, a, uh, a stable coin issued by a um, private company, um, I'm not sure what the point of this is. I mean, there may be the question of Internet of Things, uh, sort of small payments, that kind of stuff that I can see. But otherwise, why would you use it? I mean, you have already lots of payments technologies in most parts of the world. Um, a stable coin that uh, um, gives you an additional one. But is it really, I mean, what's the, what's the unique selling position of a stable coin that's issued by a private consortium. I don't see very many. The one I could see is if you have a huge network established that allows you to tap into that network. So if you do something that uses WhatsApp users, that uses Telegram users, that uses uh, Facebook users, then you have a huge network and then this becomes interesting on its own. But mm -hmm. any other stable coin that people try to create and say, well, it's great for this, it's great for that, I'm, I'm rather skeptical. I don't see much value in it. I'd rather see value 
for example, in a country like Argentina or in other countries that have experienced high inflation, not of a stable coin against the Austral or something like this, but a stable coin that is stable with regard, regard to goods or to gold or, or something that people care about, uh, not stable uh, in relation to their own currency. I mean, if you have uh, a stable coin uh, that is linked to the Bolivar, who would be interested in that? I think not many mm -hmm. people. Yeah, mm -hmm. I want, That's my view. I want to hop in and say that I agree with Peter. I think that uh, most stable coins combine the disadvantages of traditional currencies and of the newer digital currencies. So yeah, because they don't have the official support of, uh, of traditional organizations like traditional currencies do, and they do not have all the self-sufficiency and innovation and so on of decentralized coins like Bitcoin. So I'm not a big mm -hmm. believer in that. I also don't see that a lot of people use them in Israel. I mean, sure, I mean, some do, right? But I haven't seen it like a big phenomenon. Uh, with respect to a government issued uh, stable coin, so there has been talks about it. Um, they called it the Digital Shekel Project, and uh, it, so there was a team in the Bank of Israel that looked into it. I don't think anything really concrete came out of it. Um, I don't think something concrete will come out of it, because yeah, we, we need to remember when we talk about these things, that most money today is already digital, right? I mean, most money is records in the, in the bank uh, accounts, so you don't really need to put a blockchain on top of that. I mean, you can take the current systems, which some of them haven't seen too much innovation, right, and simply improve them with, uh, with the current mm -hmm. methodology. You don't need to replace the whole thing with the blockchain. Uh, blockchain is good for other things, for decentralization, for this kind of thing. So I don't think, um, so any project in this regard is either not different from what we already have, or it, uh, it just doesn't work. Mm -hmm. That's a very good point. Um, however, think about it from a remittance standpoint, right? Imagine, uh, I know Latin America is one of the largest remittance markets in the world um, after Southeast Asia, after, well, the whole Asia region. Um, and in terms of enabling stable coins as a means of payment cross border, peer to peer, that would appear to be a solution for all the unbanked population there is. Uh, because many you just mentioned, of course, maybe banks are a solution today, but how many people today are unbanked or don't have, you know, the incentives both on both sides, right? The banks don't have the incentives to onboard them and the people don't have the trust to open a bank account. So, um, and talking a little bit, uh, and, and you know, on, on the more uh, futuristic side um, on what's going on on big networks that would be able to benefit the world um, launching a stable coin, let's talk about Libra. I know Libra has, been very controversial uh, the last couple of months. Uh, I know the, the SEC, the ECB, and many other, um, many other institutions were not really welcoming of Libra. However, Peter mentioned that if a stablecoin would be launched in such a huge network, then this would be beneficial. What do you think in that regard? Well, I think uh, the point you just made uh, um, on remittances, I think that is very well taken. Uh, so I don't see any really value in Europe if you have uh, Libra. Yeah, it will be used. I mean, payments technology in particular, if everything is already electronic, like many said, uh, there's not, the, the people are quite conser conservative unless there's a real benefit. And what could there be as a real benefit is international payments remittances if it actually turns out to be cheap. Right mm -hmm. now, if you go to MoneyGram or Western Union, depending on the size of the uh, wire you are doing, you are paying uh, easily 10%, but you can pay up to close to 20% uh, if you wire yeah. money. So, so that's a, a huge, a huge case. Of course, for that, there needs to be uh, in each country where you want to do those remittances, 
the, the currency needs to be recognized. Uh, it has to have a legal framework around it. And uh, that's the difficulty with something that aims at sort of widespread adoption across the globe. And uh, that is also the difficulty that Libra is facing. And mm -hmm. uh, this is why, for example, I'm working on a project where we uh, try to exactly tap into those sort of remittance use case uh, by issuing a, a national, national digital currency that would be considered money everywhere in the world, a currency. We are doing that with the Marshall Islands, uh, but it really doesn't matter. The key thing is if you want to have such a currency used worldwide effectively, uh, then the easiest way of doing that is using a national currency because it falls into existing legislations. You need, you don't need to convince the regulators and the legislator in each country where you want to be active now to say, uh, let, uh, approve my currency. And there are uh, 200 others perhaps on the doormat and therefore these things are not going to, to move very fast. I think mm -hmm. uh, to come back to, to maybe just one, one point and Jason, I think that what has really a huge, a huge potential is a CBDC in China. Because China has not just this question of remittances and so on. China has a much bigger interest that other countries don't have. Because for international wire services, China itself is using SWIFT. And SWIFT is controlled by the US and is used for sanctions by the US. I mean, it's not officially controlled, it's independent in Belgium, but effectively the US is using SWIFT to impose financial sanctions. And uh, countries that don't want to come under the US radar uh, scheme, they would like, they, they, they must be hugely interested in having an alternative for uh, also large wire payments in their area of economic interest. And I think that is really driving the interest in China. It's also driving the interest in Russia uh, for a, a digital currency. Uh, and I think once that's going, that that will have, because there is eco economic interest and drive behind it, that could have a mm -hmm. huge impact. Yeah, on their economies for sure. Okay, excellent. So I think we've covered um, many points regarding regulation in the different regions, right? We covered Asia, uh, Latin America, Europe, and Middle East. And I think that what we've been able to see in this discussion is the need for regulation at, at some point, at some level, uh, for the protection of the users in terms of anti-money laundering, um, you know, all the KYC to have a, a like a, a, a good standard regulation. And on top of that, we've been able to discuss um, the adoption of stable coins, I think, which would be the main use that would drive real adoption. Uh, we talked about remittance and um, the roles of financial institution in launching um, and issuing their own stable coins. So I think it has been a great discussion. I think we need to wrap up. We have covered uh, a very interesting topic here. So I want to thank you all for participating today and uh, happy to get any questions. If you have, please share any comments, questions, initiatives that you want to discuss. Um, I think you'll have our contacts there. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you, Peter, Jason, many. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.